Well, everyone, it is two o'clock. I'd love to go ahead and get started. I know that you are busy and that your time is precious. And that is why I'm so appreciative of you being here. Um, we're going to cover a little bit about how you can find potential major donors in the database you already have. Um, kind of as I alluded to a minute ago, I know a lot of you have taken a step back from soliciting major gifts right now. And I hope you'll come away from this session today with some ideas about how you can continue um, building that major gifts program <clears throat> by doing prospect research, even if you're not actively asking for major donations right now. Uh, on the other hand, I know a lot of you are actively working with your major donors right now, and I think this will be really useful for you too. Before we get started, I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, my name is Abby Jarvis. I'm part of the team over at QGive. If you're not familiar with QGive, we're all about helping nonprofits raise money. Um, and more money than they would otherwise. Uh, we focus specifically on online fundraising and how to do it well, but we want to look at um, how nonprofits can raise money with all of the tools and skills available to them. And that is why I am so excited that you're gonna hear from Carolyn today. She has so much experience and valuable insight. Uh, she'll be able to help you look at various aspects of your fundraising database and how you can find potential major gifts donors in the group of people that already support you. Um, looking through the names that I see on here today, I can see we have a number of QGIVE clients with us. I am so excited to see you. Let me know if you have any questions about how you can use your QGIVE tools to do anything you see in the presentation today. Uh, if I can't help you, I will get someone who can. Uh, but if you're not a QGIVE client, don't worry. Everything we cover today applies to you and will help you too. If you do have questions about QGIVE, I can always get you in touch with someone, but everything you learn here today is going to be immediately applicable to you. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things because I always get questions about these. We are recording the webinar and you'll get a link to the recording. Uh, you'll probably get an email from me tomorrow. Um, and that will include a link to the webinar and a link to the slides and some other awesome resources that you can use to keep learning. Um, and then there is going to be time for questions at the end. If you have any questions, you can submit them through the questions box and um, we'll get to those at the end. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Carolyn now. Uh, she is going to show you some really neat tools and strategies that you can use uh, in your fundraising, and I'm so excited for you to hear what she has to share today. Thanks, Abby. Thanks to QGIVE for having me. And I actually learned about QGIVE originally from my local nonprofit tech club, which is co sponsored by N10 Nonprofit Technology Network and NetSquared, a division of TechSoup. And uh, a couple of representatives came and spoke to our club and I was hooked. I happened to be working with a nonprofit that needed to have an online gift processor. And so I actually got into the back end of QGIVE and I set it up myself by hand and I was so impressed. So I just like I'm raving all the time about QGIVE. But the truth is my uh, expertise is mostly in major gift fundraising with a sideline of new technologies in that context. So uh, I'm pleased to be speaking today. And I do think with the COVID stay at home restrictions, um, this is a time to do some meaningful research. And it would be my um, observation that the better research you do, the more in-depth and thoughtful research you do, the better off you and your nonprofit are gonna be for the long term. And I have, and I will share, um, uh, stories about where I have just sat down with a list, taken hours and hours, days and days, but I have found some really wonderful hidden gems. So I'll share some of those success, success stories with you. But <clears throat> my background is uh, first just two degrees from UT Austin, which means I uh, am formally trained in research and writing. In, uh, I published early in my career and uh, I was an art history major, so I just had a gift for writing and I ended up doing that before I even graduated. Communications, especially online, have come naturally and with an artistic bent design, graphic design. So I use, do a lot of my own graphic design at the same time. Um, I have now more than 30 years of hands-on major gift experience and I would say 
there was a point in the 1990s, mid 1990s, where I got thrown into the deep end. I actually was kind of tricked into tackling a major gift campaign. There was some really great names attached to it, but when I got on site, it was a complete disaster. It was like not only were the relationships with anybody who had ever funded it um, damaged, they were actually very negative in less than zero territory. So I had to dig myself out and I actually at that time thought that uh, my career was over. I thought that was it. Uh, I mean, it just was like, there, this is impossible. But I started just talking to donors and uh, inching my way out of it. And some of my findings later in this slideshow will attest to that. So I say never say never, because after that time, I got so much courage that for good causes, I would be uh, able to jump in and help them raise money when everybody was telling them, no, you, there's no way, or we tried, we failed, it won't work. People saying, no, you can't. That just is my now my buzzword for, yes, I can. I will figure it out. So, um, and I've had to do it with um, little or no staff. I've been uh, in areas where the staff actually tried to stop me from doing my job. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's just amazing what, what situations you can get into because they've tried to stop it because they thought it will never happen. It won't work. I'm not going to help. It's too painful for me to go into that area. So I've had to venture on my own with that never say never attitude. And today, just as an aside, communications and uh, visual graphic design, et cetera, go hand in hand with what I do because I, uh, in major gift fundraising today, I think you have to control some of the messaging that goes out on like social media and how your image is and how professional you look. And so therefore, I love to take over uh, some at least communications in addition to the major gift research and writing grants and solicitation. But given all that training and experience, does it really matter? And for me, that academic training certainly did help. I actually was encouraged to go on and get a PhD, but I really liked working with people and I had been volunteering for the local art museum and I got a job there and I ended up in development. And what the development staff noticed was I could research and write. So my beginning of my career started as a volunteer, I then got hired, and then I was writing grants and researching right away. So, I, but I would say if you have a calm, methodical mind and you're willing to sit still without interruption for long stretches of time and do the job, do the research, you're going to be good to go. If you've got that mental set, you don't need to have a lot of distractions and when you're doing this, you really need to have a calm mind and you need to uh, focus. And if your executive director will let you do that, it's gonna be very productive use of your time. Now, first things first, I read every single day and I uh, am addicted to my little iPhone over here. I get, um, here's a few tools I use. Google News, boy, I am a Googler. And so I've set up Google News Alerts. You can set alerts to follow topics. You can get alerts on the Ford Foundation if you want. Just put that in there, that's your alert, and it'll pull every day or every week, however much you want it. It'll put up news about that alert, that, that person, place, or thing. And so I get those every day. It doesn't actually catch every single thing, but it catches most of it up. So I read every day. I get my email every day and I go through it and I say, well, what's going on with so-and-so? And I would also say, you know, I, I am a Googler, as I mentioned, I'm a real fan of Google. And um, so self-directed internet research, just putting names in and searching around, grants 4K through 12, whatever it is, just you can search online. You should never be bored. The internet is the most wonderful tool for nonprofits if, if used properly. And I'll uh, go into detail about GuideStar profiles. As you probably know, Candid is now the parent organization of the Foundation Center and GuideStar. And if you're doing it right as a nonprofit organization, you've gone into GuideStar, gotten a free profile, and you've updated your GuideStar profile to at least the gold or the platinum level. 
and you have downloaded that seal once approved to your website so people know I'm paying attention. Basically, the issue, I've, and I've had a lot of nonprofits that don't like this. They don't want to focus on GunStar, but the fact is, whether you like it or not, your nonprofit's tax return is uploaded every year to GunStar. It's not a choice that you have. And so you're there. So why not take your profile and make it shine? Just fill in some information. And really, it's not based on how much money you raise. It's how much information you provide. So the little guys and the big guys are on there. And also, a lot of people don't realize that private foundations are nonprofit organizations. So their tax returns, if they're filing them, those are on GuideStar. And you can search, you know, um, all foundations in Austin, Texas. You know, all, you know, you can do a basic search on GuideStar, and I'll talk about that more later but basically there's a lot of information but you will want to actually read tax returns uh business media this i learned to do early on and i can't say enough about it because it's so current to what's going on now and so many fortunes that created private foundations were actually begun through a business enterprise and so these business uh, magazines and your local business media um, are excellent ways to understand the big picture of the economy, who's, what companies are doing well, and what, are, what companies are not doing well, you know, what's happening, what uh, projects are funding, and because our society is moving into a more compassionate form of capitalism, this is really a, a great uh, resource for you. Uh, even Forbes has created its own separate nonprofit uh, article section. So, you know, they're work in a, some ways we're starting to merge together a little bit in terms of what our missions are and our ultimate causes. And employees today do not want to uh, be hired and work for companies that are not socially conscious. And that is increasingly true with younger generations coming in. So, as a result, the business press is even better and better every year finding out what is going on and great ideas for um, projects that um, they're funding. So you can work your way through those and you'll learn a lot. Uh, other uh, tools, now I know that people are gonna say, oh, you're so fluffy when you think I should read P People Magazine, but man, I've gotten some great gems in there, like somebody I had no idea was really interested in gender equality. You know, somebody who's working on uh, girls who code, you know, or AIDS, you know. So my point is, it obviously, it's hard for most of us to reach out and actually get a celebrity to endorse what we're doing in our hometown, you know. But look at, the fact is, these people have very sophisticated teams working behind them to pitch their causes to potential donors. So I am looking at that for certainly, I, I mean, I might ask them uh, to support uh, my cause, but basically I'm looking also at the case for support that I'm developing, that is messaging. How are they messaging people? And maybe my little AIDS nonprofit locally, I could uh, ask that group to say, look, we're, we're a small group, but we share the same goal. Would you be willing to just, you know, send out information about us or, uh, team up on this small project together, whatever. But anyway, so I look at those. Now, there are a lot of charity publications. We all are on their email list and they do a great job. But you need to kind of look for what's going on now because basically a lot of them will report gifts that are already done. And so you get like, oh, Mayo Clinic just got $100 million. Wow, I'm going to get that too. No, no, probably not. That's probably a one-time huge gift. You might be able to apply to Mayo Clinic to get a part of that grant for your specific area that ties into the bigger picture. But basically, a lot of times the charity publications are good for giving you the story about how a gift came about and what it's gonna focus on and all that. I just say the business publications because they're in business today, now, 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 now. So I am really cued into those. And I also really love the Philanthropy News Digest alerts and newsletters. And there's a link, you can sign up and get those free. 
and I constantly find good leads to RFPs, requests for proposals, for on a variety of topics. And there are groups that I've worked with years ago, and I'm still sending them. Did you see this RFP? <laughs> you know, so sign up and get those, and that's uh, also part of the Candid Network there, Foundation Center, and that excellent team. Okay, search engines. I actually searched and I found the top search engines today. I searched on my searchers. And uh, so here you go. So there are lots of them. And here's what I wanna say about that. You can search on Google, my favorite, and um, you'll get the information you're gonna get. But sometimes I there won't be as much information as needs. So I'll get on Bing or Yahoo and I'll go, well, and sometimes I'll find information I'm looking for and it's actually not coming up very high in Google. So uh, I'm, I'm just saying, you, you know, use several of them to uh, conduct research. Uh, I would say Google's, you know, of course, the very best, but these others can be helpful. So keep them in mind. Now, kind of to the meat and the how to spreadsheets. You may be, I know many nonprofits, small and large, you know, and they're keeping their kind of lists of constituents and donors all over the place. And that's fine. You know, are you QGIV? You can have a wonderful, that in a way could be your own CRM, you know, that it's a really great database for your don of donors. You know, that's obviously going to be where people are, are paying directly to the nonprofit right now. So, but you might have Z2 Neon, Black Bog, Razor's Edge, Bloomerang, Donor Perfect, you know, all of those, uh, and uh, and email, many kinds of email, but most every one of those, to my knowledge, you can export that data as an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and so I would do that. Um, I would export it uh, into just a plain Jane Excel spreadsheet or a similar, you know, if you want to use Google Sheets, that's obviously excellent as well. But I reformat my spreadsheets as a workbook that I can edit, get back and forth, back and forth. And I make the typeface larger and I remove every piece of unnecessary information so I don't have a whole lot of columns going across the page. I mean, really, I'm keeping the name, as much of the name as I have, the address, the email address and any other information that might, you know, be really important, like did they ever donate ever, you know, or what they donate, you might want to include that. You might want to merge all of your list into one list. But if you do that, I would suggest you code each entry with, this came from MailChimp, this came from QGIF, this came from Bloomerang. So you, if you go back to that track, you know the source of that, especially if you have a really large list. And then you just need to kind of get a cup of coffee and start researching. So things I'm looking for. I have found amazing prospects just on by email, you know. Um, just look at each URL, like objectively. Don't even look at their name address. Just look at that email address. What's the first part, you know? What is, is it? associated with a company or a foundation. Like I just, for example, use netsuite.com or communitiesfoundationoftexas.org. I'm looking for that. And if that person's on my list, that must mean they're paying attention. So I am definitely going to be highlighting them. Gmail, Hotmail, AT&T.net, those are going to be really challenging because, you know, it's generic pretty much in terms of you can't really see where they're associated, but you can look at the first part of the email. Now, I don't think Bill Gates has a Gmail account. <laughs> I think he has an Outlook account, but you can see what I'm getting at. You know, you want to kind of see then, well, maybe this name is going to ring a bell from all the reading I've done in the newspaper and all that, and maybe that'll help. But I have found some major corporations and foundations for nonprofits uh, through just looking who's receiving the email. Who is listening to what I'm saying, you know, and uh, then working my way back through that. So there you go. I start searching. I kind of pair them up. Google search, my little search engine screen and my you know, spreadsheet there. 
and I just go through them one at a time. It's some of these projects have taken me weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, and you might just want to do it routinely every month, just kind of look through and make sure you know who's really paying attention, who's on your list, who's donating even $5, it doesn't matter. Um, and then I just search elsewhere um, on Google and I'm looking at their company and foundation websites or the name. Sometimes I will go to Google and I'll just like put in the email address because they might be a contact for something and that's helpful. Again, I highlight the ones I want to know about. And then, I'm, I know I'm jumping ahead there, but when you feel comfortable, you found um, you know, Joe Smith at Costco, and that's a corporate connection. I said, well, I'm going to reach out by email. I mean, they're on my email list. I'm just going to say, hey, you know, thanks for your support. I noticed you're on our email list. And I wondered, you know, could you help me find the right person who's in charge of community giving and partnerships? I just don't know. I'm always really honest. Like, I honestly have no clue. And, uh, you know, sometimes they don't answer back, but a lot of times they do. And uh, it's really a nice way to reach out. And it's very simple by email. But I would say, don't forget, today, the person you may need to speak with may be the person you're emailing. Companies are paying attention to what their employees want to fund. If you're just thinking you're going to hop, skip, and jump over their head and get to the main office of the um, of the community partnerships program for the company, uh, and you're just not paying attention and not you just want to get there and get away from this person, it just that's stupid, you know, today because everyone matters. Courtesy always counts, but it's becoming more and more true that everybody uh, rank and file at a company can be really influential. And if you, what happens, you know, you are rude to them, you never answer them back, you jumped over your head, went, and then they, somebody asks them and said, do you, do you like this nonprofit? No, they're like really rude. They didn't even, you know what I'm saying. So not to belabor it. Uh, I know on Google, you can also search for, Wealthiest zip codes in your city. I've done this recently, actually. And take that list and start searching on your own spreadsheet and see if anybody comes up. Look at those zip codes. That's really a fun process. Um, and then I routinely will check for names in the local news. Any nonprofits they're on the board of, that they're affiliated with, or they're in a picture at some gala that they attended, or there's other interests that they might have. So, but the only caveat I will say, it's not always true, but it is often the case that some very wealthy people live in the same house for years and years. And that may be in an older neighborhood that's not in a wealthy zip code. So it's not always the case that, um, you know, wealthy neighborhoods are gonna yield big donors for your nonprofit. <laughs> and some, you'll find out, are house rich and cash poor. They've sunk everything into home and love the neighborhood and they really don't know what to do. So that's just to be cautious uh, and not to overuse it, but it is a great way to hone down your list to some degree. So once you uh, begin going through your list like this, and again, it takes time and it takes quiet time to do this. You're going to naturally start honing down on prospects. And again, keep in mind, some who seem like good prospects initially might not necessarily be the donors in the end, but they could lead your nonprofit to others who could. Uh, donors and influencers are both important. And that's certainly true at corporations today. Uh, and even if you have somebody that looks like they're living in the right kind of a neighborhood and they end up not being um, necessarily a good prospect for you, sometimes I will get in a dialogue with them and I'll say, you know, we're getting ready to do this big campaign and we're just getting started. And do you know anybody in your area that's working on this specific issue? Could I maybe link up or I just try and get in a conversation. Everybody's valuable, whether they're a donor or they're an influencer. I think we need to be respectful and also realize the power of influencers. And they're influencers of all ages. Just know that's definitely true. And to your mind, here's another point. 
your mind is going to remember names and facts over time. And I would say that your brain is a database. You know, it's your own personal database in your head. And after many years, I can remember people involved in prior nonprofits from years ago who were supportive of who turned out not to be supportive, but they knew so and so. But the point is, you're building your brain's database as well as your nonprofit's database. And you'll start putting two and two together. So let your brain go to work for you. Now, case study. Here is a fun one. This is one of my absolute favorite all time experiences. I was working with a conservation nonprofit, a national one, and I was looking through a huge Excel spreadsheet of names, addresses, and phone numbers and emails. And I came across a name that just rang a bell and I wasn't quite sure. So, you know, I had to do some research. Oh, I found out they actually were part of a large foundation family in another city, actually. But it took, they were giving a membership of $25 a year for several years. So it took them being put on an advisory council in their community, then graduating up to being on the board for the state chapter. And then they liked us enough to where they helped introduce us to their family foundation, whereupon we got $5 million for land acquisition. I would say that was a huge home run. It did take time to get there, totally worth it. Now, I'm gonna just di diverge a tiny bit here, but I this campaign that I mentioned to you uh, several years ago where it was so damaged, it was beyond belief, really. I just thought my career was over. There, there really wasn't a donor list. In fact, the donor records had disappeared. So <clears throat> I thought my career's over, what am I gonna do? And then this nonprofit was really, had been in the community for many years and it had gained lots of board members. Actually, there were over a hundred board members. I mean, how effective can you be with a board like that, you know? And I didn't recognize any of the names and I was a pretty seasoned fundraiser in this city. So I actually did my own research. I, I just went through, found leading companies, leading foundations. I simply put down their board members and key executives on a list. And I had a copy shop print it all out and I mailed it to each member of the board with a pen and a self uh, stamped a return envelope that was already prepaid. And I just said, could you please check any people you know, make notes, et cetera, and just send it back to me. And I told them, I said, you, this is not that you have to approach them because most people were like, no, I'm not asking. Are you kidding? No way. And I said, this is not about you having to ask, but if I could know that you know them, and then maybe we could check back with you and see how you know them, and then maybe I can help develop a strategy. And so what we discovered was we had board members who were really not major donors, but they knew people who were, oh yeah, I, uh, I went to high school with so-and-so and he's now head of the major major corporation here. And all I needed was to be able to say, can I, can, would you consider just asking if we can come visit them or um, can I use your name to just get my foot in the door? You know, like, oh, so-and-so is on our board and they said, you're so great. And they were reminiscing about high school and all the good times. And I just wonder if you might have an interest in my topic here, which was a zoo expansion at the time. So I would say, put your board members to work don't break them out with, you have to raise money now. I hear that so often, like that's your job. A lot of them are really influential, but they're not gonna do that kind of thing. You know, you need to be subtle and let them rise to the occasion or let them be shy, but share the information. And so I built a database from zero uh, doing that kind of a thing. And I did add a bunch of my own prospects that I just knew would be good. and. You know, we were in a $10 million capital campaign. By golly, that worked. So we went from less than zero support in the community to 100% support. And it was based on solid research. Now here's a more modest sized group of uh, 
locally here in Texas and all volunteer emergency response organizations just really love them. And they had no time at all. They're all volunteer, there was no staff, and they needed to uh, have some infrastructure developed basically. So I was hired to look at everything, ramp it up. And I took their spreadsheet, they had been saving, that's all they had. They had one Excel spreadsheet that had maybe 60 records on it. And so I went through it. First of all, I had to thank people, you know, with a real thank you letter in the snail mail, signed by the then chairman of the board, you know, to kind of underscore the importance of what, what we felt about them and how we cared about them. So we did that. But I was going through the records and I thought, I'm just going to find somebody. What am I going to? There's got to be somebody on this list who's capable of giving a little bit more. So I found an, a board member of a foundation who had made a donation of $100. Also discovered a billionaire in an entirely another city who had made a $100 donation. I put bingo there because I, that just sums up how excited I was, you know, <laughs> to find him. So in addition to just getting donations in the mail through checks in their case, this group used GoFundMe. Uh, it was after a major flooding emergency and they needed equipment and support to get, get geared up to continue serving the community. So now GoFundMe and similar platforms protect everybody whose emails are on those platforms. And I think that's a good idea. I was able to search through 80 names and partial emails because it would not show me the full email, it would show me like their name part of the email or something like that. So, I was able to search and find a few that way, but also I went through every 80, pers 80 people on that list, spent a week doing thank you notes within the GoFundMe platform over and over and over to every single 80 person donor. <laughs> so I really wanted them to know. And then on GoFundMe, which is really a nice feature of the platform, I had the then chairman of the board, president of the board, uh, do updates every couple of weeks. Like, hey, this is what's going on. Thanks for your support. This is where we're at. And so people could keep kind of donating, even past donating past the emergency response event. So the other thing I would say in all these cases, and you kind of have, yes, that but cultivation is required. And certainly just make sure you actually have thanked them. If they're donors, please thank them. Uh, as soon as you can, and in case of this nonprofit, it had been like six months and they hadn't thanked them because they had nobody to do the work till I got on there. So that is the first thing I did was I sat down and I thanked them. And then I had a way to kind of go back politely and say, hey, I noticed you're on the so-and-so foundation. I wonder, could we, I noticed you have a deadline coming up. Could we apply for support through your uh, process of grant making online, that kind of a thing. Uh, but basically, and QGIVE I think has had some great webinars on this, you know, you need to have a little cultivation plan. Everybody's going to be kind of in a different place. Uh, so you need to start that dialogue and start working them through the process so that they can um, become donors in a way that is not rushed and to smash and grab because I know some nonprofits are like, ah, we need the money now, give it to us. And that generally doesn't work. You know? Cultivation is like slow dancing. I worked with the vice chairman of Chase uh, Bank years ago, and I thought that was the nicest way of saying what this is about. It's it's so exciting when you find those prospects like, oh my gosh, they're on my list. I want to get to them right away. But you need to just be sure you don't jump the gun on them because uh, it it's might be too jarring. You know, it's like, Ooh, wait, you want too much too fast. So it's just still donor cultivation leading to a major gift giving. It's like a slow dance. As he said, once you found them, don't ask them to marry you on the spot. It doesn't work. <laughs> so, so just know it's very really. I can tell you, I've gotten so so excited when I found a I found a prospect on my list like that. But um, you have to pull the reins in a little bit and get your reality focused here. So, some sources for you. 
Now, public libraries, most of our libraries are sadly closed right now, but um, when they reopen, uh, as you know, I mentioned Candid is now the parent organization of the Foundation Center and GuideStar, those are together. And the Foundation Directory Online is on many library computers free of charge. And I talked to the Austin Public Library and before COVID and the state home restrictions, they said you could access the database from your own laptop once you get inside the library and, and officially, or they have a lot of computer workstations and you can do it from there. So just call your library and resource center to see what's available and search on um, your uh, on Candid for your local foundation center resource because most communities do have places where they're kind of that's a hub of their activity and they do subscribe to the foundation center and it's one of the best resources you could possibly ever have. It's really the best. Here, these are pictures actually of me searching. I, luckily, I did this before the restrictions <laughs> for stay at home were made. But basically, I see that on the left, that's a little login screen. The librarian had to log me in, give me a code, and then I was free to go for an hour or extend my time if I needed to. And so you get on Foundation Center, it's like, okay, there's all kinds of search codes K through 12. Uh, gender equality, whatever the issue is, wildlife conservation, you kind of set up your searches and see what happens in Detroit, in Houston, in Washington. So you can do that. And then you start going through the profiles that have been revealed that look interesting to yourself. Now, when you're in the library, you can't stay there for hours and hours on end. I mean, you could, but it might drive you crazy. So the nice thing about the Foundation Center is you can email, you can, the search that you've pulled up, you can email that as a PDF to yourself at home. So when I'm at the library and I am on that computer, I am emailing, I say, wow, this is a good search. I need to email that to myself. You can email the whole profile to yourself or just the search that you were, like all grants from 2018, whatever it is in the right hand corner up there, it'll give you that option. And so I stack up all my stuff that I've gotten on email and I go through it when I'm at home at my home office. And I mentioned GodStar, which is such a great resource. And you're, again, if you're a nonprofit, your tax returns are gonna get uploaded here, whether you like it or not. So you might as well do your profile. But when it comes to looking for foundations, uh, and, and, you know, trying to find somebody in there. You'll notice, like, it gets harder every year. You know, people don't want a mailing address to appear. So you can't find them, and but you know they're there, and you know they might be interested in your project. So I, I just skip it all, go right to the tax return. The most recent tax return I can find, and I go through them page by page. I know it can be boring, but... Often I will find an official address. It may be uh, their accounting firm, whatever, but I might give that a try. I can find out who's on the board. And sometimes, you know, board members shift and somebody's now the treasurer that was the president and who's the president now and all that kind of information, what they're investing in. Sometimes, not everybody does this, but a lot of times they'll say, here are our official application guidelines. That's nice when they do it. It's not too common. It's amazing to me that these form 990s are, there is like this one form, but everybody seems to fill it out totally differently. So it's, you, you know, it's worth reading them. It's like, okay, well, this is totally different from the other one I just looked at. But I use, it, GuideStar again is a free database, you know, uh, the basics. You can ramp up and have, you know, higher capabilities but you can do a whole lot by reading those foundation tax returns. Also, you know, if it's a nonprofit, it'll find for you if you're searching for a board member, see where they might be. So this is just boring me looking at the computer and taking an iPhone photograph of a tax return. <laughs> so other resources. Okay, 
Foundation Center is the mother of all uh, resource centers and databases for fundraising, and it's the cleanest, it's the neatest, it's been in existence the longest, as far as I know. Um, they do have monthly plans. In my original uh, version of this talk, I was going to say you can do modified searches on the Foundation Center free of charge, but you can't anymore. But there are cheap monthly plans available, like 30 some odd dollars, which probably is worth it. I don't know if you can just do one month and say, could I just search this month and do this work? Or if you have to get into an annual plan, but whatever you do, that would be a great place to start. Many of you have heard about GrantStation. It's another great database and alert system. Uh, if you will join TechSoup and any nonprofit can join TechSoup, you can then receive a discount. And sometimes they'll do a flash sale like just this month, it's even half price off the discount. So it it's an annual kind of a fee, but it's totally worth it. I, I tend to try and do things without paying for anything. I admit it, I'm a cheapskate, but uh, I know many people who really like Grand Station, so I just wanted to point that out and that you can get a discount from TechSoup, which is a great outfit. You know Grants.gov, they have a new app. I was on there the other day, and it's free, and that is, like, totally awesome. Then there are some other paid search engines, you know. Again, they have different fees depending on what uh, your, your needs are, and, you know, you'll find those and see if they're going to be good. But I would say if I was going to do it, it'd be the Foundation Center, those first three, Grant Station and Grants.gov. Now, here's the other thing. Since I'm a kind of a cheapskate, I try and do everything for free, but sometimes it's worth engaging a company to do professional wealth screening. And I, this can be a few thousand dollars or more but you could probably get a lot of money if you invest in it. And where this is really good, in my estimation, so you're gonna plan a major gift campaign of any kind, and you have a halfway decent list to work off of. Um, it will uh, just narrow your search results down. It'll pull everybody out. And you can run the very simple Excel spreadsheet through that name, address, telephone, email. If you just even just have that, it can pull up a lot. Um, there are different companies that do it. Wealth Engine, I've used myself three times. Donor Search, of course. iWave is a new one, it's really cool. I just have a demo myself to see what's going on with that. And um, so it, what it does is they have uh, online today, there are databases about who owns what stock of publicly traded companies, who owns a plane, who owns a car, who owns an apartment complex, who owns a ranch, and it'll compile all of that information into profiles. It'll pull up what their estimated net worth is at any given time. And it'll also, a lot of times we'll say, we estimate they could probably give you this kind of a pledge over so many years. So um, it's, it really is helpful. Uh, the thing, the time when it's not helpful is when your prospects have privately held companies because that's not public information and it's just not online. So I did have somebody I knew who um, I'd known through friends of friends that they were worth several hundred million dollars. So I got online, I found they had a car and that was valued at $25,000. So um, that was it. So I knew I was going to have to pivot to another type of research there, which is asking friends of friends. But so you can't get it all. But I tell you what, it will do. It'll keep you from going. Oh, Bill Gates, he's in the news. I hear he could fund our project with millions of dollars. So here in Texas, it's it's Michael Dell. Michael Dell will fund it, won't he? I get that from board members a lot of the times. It's like, no, it's actually not gonna, that's not a focus area for his foundation, sorry. So it'll it'll bring up the plumber who's done really well, uh, somebody who's just invested quietly, never goes out of the house much, you know, really quiet introvert. It'll pull those people up. And I can tell you, I have run these results before some of the top bankers in the state of Texas, and they were tough on me 
and they were like yeah what what kind of a you know, algorithm are they using there and they want to like pick me apart and I had one of them after I, I just knew they were going to give me a hard time after presenting my hundred million dollar plus results I was really nervous so at the end of it chairman of the board said this is the best damn thing I've ever seen for nonprofits, you know. <laughs> and I thought, victory. So I'm just saying, sometimes if you really have a bigger goal, you're going to want to do that because you can find a lot of people and it will be people off the radar that you just had no idea. And it'll keep you from going to poor Michael Dell and Bill and Melinda Gates, who are already funding so many great things. But they're in the news all the time. That doesn't mean they're necessarily going to fund your problem. So. Uh, I think it might be worth the investment. And it, some of these plans now, uh, you know, will be appended to your software. Um, for instance, Blackbox is really good. I, I believe they have links. So that's a really expensive constituent donor data management database system, but it's really good. And that capability of having Wealth Engine, like, right, you can do it yourself right there on the computer if you've got that system. So some of them append right to your CRM if that's what you've got, but you can just have them do it independently for a few thousand dollars. And I, I have found that to be worth it when I needed it. So I would say, take the time to review your own list. You think nobody's on there and you're wrong. <laughs> so. Uh, even a small list can yield dramatic results be a detective and use the internet and these databases i'm talking about and the internet search these are publicly this is publicly available information it's ethically sourced information there's nothing sneaky about it i do have I, every board i've worked with where i've suggested wealth screening they have uh said oh we don't want to be prying into people's personal lives it's like well it's all on the internet and they own private they own a lot of stock and xyz company that is publicly available information so it's not unethical it's out there so why not give let the nonprofits find it you know um so you don't need my, I, my other message is you don't need an outside consultant to do this this is just hard work in the trenches just get in there and do it. And you know your cause the best. Just spend the time to go through, go through. And maybe every month you need to set a time, side time just to, as I mentioned, to review your list. If somebody new is signed up, kind of check in on them. And uh, read often multiple news sources, business press. I have to say it's just outstanding. It's getting better every year. And just learn what's going on in your community, but also the big picture company happening new stuff old stuff changes who's in charge all that stuff your brain is amazing so there you go That's how you use it. but in closing i would also say uh security is essential you know uh you need to be aware what you're doing is really important for your nonprofit, but you need to keep that confidential that's not something that needs to go out to other nonprofits or other people without you know, some precautions. You need to clear your computer's browsing history. I do it every single day. And if you are really gonna do this seriously, you might uh, invest in a virtual protection network if you're gonna be doing this again really seriously because that way you're really gonna be protected. And Wired Magazine, if you get on there, there's a great, article that just came out a couple of days ago about protecting your search and remaining private and how to go about it. It's a great how-to and it talks about VPN and I, I admit I have not always known what VPN uh, means so I got on there and I did some searching and now I'm like impressed that I might need to do that. So that's one thing to do. I have worked with small nonprofits so ramping up they have uh, patched together a bunch of uh, computer equipment. They got hacked through a printer once. They had an old laptop. It was kind of the heart and soul of the whole thing, and that was totally insecure. So I would just say security, please. You know, you've got to protect uh, your constituents, but also your prospects. And so shred, hashtag shred. And respect. Some people have paid to remove as much as they can about them. 
from the internet. I mean, it's, I'll definitely recognize that that's the case and we have to respect that. You, you know, and so you need to pivot again, as I mentioned, you're going to need to ask somebody who knows them. You have a hunch, but you, you know, not quite sure about exactly what they're capable of giving. Can you get an introduction? Can you get them interested in your project? That kind of thing. And that board member should be able to help you. So that's it. Thank you. There is my email and my blog, and I um, am happy to take questions. I know Abby is collecting some questions. Also, I would say sign up for the QGIV blog. I actually have a, an article about my work with the nonprofit where I installed QGIV and why I think it's such a great credibility building activity to have a real serious online gift processor in place and not look like you know people have to just show up with a check in person, which of course now you really can't uh, do. You can send it by mail, of course, but um, there you go. So print them on email. And that's, well, this was great. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, just for my benefit, um, so one thing I come up against a lot uh, in my work on the board here in town is a lot of board members maybe do have connections with people who could be potential uh, supporters, but they are really reluctant to let um, major gifts fundraisers or researchers kind of access those connections or make use of those connections. What could someone bring up when they're talking to their board members who are reluctant to introduce them to friends? You know, I um, definitely want to respect the board members because I've worked with many board members who are actually really shy. And I have to say, would you allow me to make an appointment and say that so-and-so sent you know, their mutual friend, or can I give you information that might be helpful that I could, uh, that you could pass along to your colleague? Would that be possible? I try and find ways to make it really super easy for the board member to make that introduction, you know? And I if they are not willing to do it though, they're not willing to do it, it might be by accident that they mention it someday, you know, and there's not much you can do to get past that. Uh, you know, I want to be respectful. They might be helpful to your nonprofit in other ways, you know, mm -hmm. um, but basically they should do it. It's just like, as I said earlier about that one group years ago where I had to literally just do my own research and go, hey, do you know anybody on this board? any of the CEOs on these company boards or whatever. And um, that helped urge the process forward a bit in a subtle way, uh, but sometimes you just have to back off. I'm not a big one for being obnoxious. If, sure. But if somebody says, well, I might, I might give them a little time and wait till it feels comfortable and go back just one-on-one -on -one and do it. I wouldn't, I'll tell you what, people in a group, also if you're at the board meeting and you think I'm gonna ask everybody right this minute and then people do not speak up about who they know and what they know in a group setting. They do not do it and that's smart of them not to. <laughs> so basically you might need to get one-on-one -on -one with that person, get them out of the board meeting because they don't wanna commit or let so-and-so two seats down that, that they actually are doing the banking for XYZ. <laughs> um, so, you know, you might need to get off the off the public bandwagon and into a one-on-one -on -one situation. Ask. Okay. That it makes a lot of sense. Um, I heard an interesting piece of advice too, where I want, I don't remember who it was. Someone recommended, um, arranging a meeting with you and the board member so it doesn't it looks like they're involved too but they don't have to do a lot of the talking do you think that's a reasonable uh, approach or do you think that could be more distracting than anything actually that that has really worked well i've worked with several uh really you know civic leaders who give speeches regularly and they're well recognized in their communities but um when it comes to asking, they will not do it. And they have told me, it's like, no way, man, no way. I'm not gonna ask 
I once uh, took the head of a community college into a trust department at Bank of America. He was the most charismatic, wonderful human being. And I said, listen, I'm going to do all the asking part. If you wouldn't mind, just say why your group is so wonderful. That's all. That's it. He did that. Their jaws dropped in the trust department. Then I said, well, we'd like to apply to this trust. And we wonder how to go about it. Now, I'm going to do the follow-up. So let me tell me what I need to do. Put me to work. You know, I'm the staff member. Put me to work. And uh, that worked great. I relieved his pressure completely. And we got the grant. <laughs> because oh, it never comes mm -hmm. the brass tacks. Providing the data, submitting at the proper time, going through the review process, answering the questions, following up, that kind of thing. So. Um, I'm really used to staffing people where the um, person will not speak. And you would think, given their persona and their public image, that they would, and they hate asking. That's just it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, the other question we had was around foundations. I know you reiterated several times throughout your presentation that when you're looking at um, potential individuals who could be good prospects. You really emphasize um, cultivation. Is there mm -hmm. a reason to do cultivation with foundations or is that kind of governed by a different set of rules? Is there a way to cultivate relationships with foundations? You know, you're kind of cultivating relationship with the person who knows the foundation or who's on the board of foundation or is part of the foundation family. Okay. So it's the foundation has its own rules and application format and guidelines. You just follow. You have to follow that. But uh, it's the person connected to you that you know that you need to kind of cultivate and get them really super comfortable uh, talking to you and uh, ratcheting up a little strategy for approaching the foundation. So if you know a person. Sometimes you just have to get on there and apply, and there's just nothing you can, no additional cultivation you can do. But I will say this, we're in a really difficult time with COVID-19, uh, but a, one of the largest foundations in the state, uh, when we went through the economic decline 10 years ago, and I drove from my city up to visit him in person. He's one of the deans of Texas Foundation, you know, and I, I thought, oh, you know, there's no chance in hell that I'm going to get in here. I'm going to try. So I actually got a meeting. And he told me this. He said, you know what? You think you're the only one applying, but there's a line out the door. If you get out of line, you get freaked out, you're not going to apply, then you just get out of line. And so when the family he worked for at the foundation, was looking at proposals. I wouldn't even be in the list if I had chickened out. And I right. thought, just go ahead, right. go ahead and apply. We're going to get turned down, but I'm just going to go ahead and get one. So sometimes there is value. You just don't give up, keep applying and get in line. And you might be surprised at what you find out. Um, also, they're, they are really super sophisticated. Obviously, people for a long time didn't think major gift donors and foundations and companies were on the internet, on social media, and they are. They're conducting research on nonprofits just like we're conducting research on them. <laughs> so <laughs> how you present yourself makes a big difference online today more than ever. And uh, I have had one nonprofit that I just love, 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 and I wanted somebody to support it. And I said, oh gosh, you should support this very wealthy family in Texas. And she came back at me about a week later and said, you know, I got on the internet and I looked at their website and it wasn't very, it wasn't very good. <laughs> it's like they had not taken the time to fool with their website, but they were literally changing the world. Okay. They were mm. so good. But because they looked kind of, you know, there was old posts on there. It wasn't too fancy looking and wouldn't didn't look very good. She just thought they were dumb and they were anything but dumb. So you have to pay attention to your presence and how you look. And that's why I say when I do major gift fundraising, I routinely go through all the social media, all the entire website, 
I look at everything and I say, what's going to make somebody who gets on here who doesn't really know me but's trying to find out something, what's going to make them feel really good about my group? And it doesn't have to be expensive, thank heaven, today, but it does need to look sharp and be to the point and easy to find information. Where is your mission? What is your history? Where is the donate? <laughs> you know, all that needs to be real clear. Well, that is very helpful um, and is interesting. We just did a study on uh, different generational preferences, and uh, we've learned that a surprising number of people uh, are really, you can make or break their decision by your website. So that's great advice there. Um, well, and also, Q, I would say QGIV. That's what I say. You know, if you get on there and it's like mail your check to, it's like, well, no, I'm not doing it. Even major foundations are doing electronic transfer today. So yeah. get get QGIV. You can get a basic plan, get it in place, go straight from them to your bank account. They don't have to do the post service. And uh, if you provide them a bunch of options, you look like you really have your finances uh, good to go and your bank's in tune and everything's set. That is great advice. Um, everybody, if you have more questions about um, how to set up your website to appeal to foundations, if you have questions about um, major gifts fundraising, I would really encourage you to check out Carolyn Appleton's website. Um, follow her on Twitter. She is churning out some phenomenal content uh, that is really helpful as, no matter where you are in your major gifts fundraising. And I know you, you Carolyn gets into other topics too. Um, we've hit three o'clock. You guys have been so attentive and so much fun today. Carolyn, thank you so much for hopping on here and sharing your expertise with us. We love working with you. And this was a really great presentation that was really, really like strategic and you can get off the computer and do something with it. Um, and I <laughs> really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, sure. Everyone, I will email you uh, tomorrow with a recording of this presentation. Carolyn gave me her slides. Uh, she is an overachiever and even had them to me early, which is <laughs> unprecedented. I'll make sure you get the slides as well. Um, and then we'll send you a couple other things. I know Carolyn mentioned um, the importance of doing follow-up and cultivation. I can send you some information around how you can get that started. But thank you so much for tuning in today, for giving us your time and attention. I know you are fundraisers and that you're busy anyway, and I know you have more on your plate now than you probably have in a very long time. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Carolyn, I'll talk to you later. Everyone keep your eye out on your uh, inbox for the upcoming email. I hope you all have a beautiful Tuesday and a great rest of the week. Everybody, bye-bye.